so yeah, uh, so I don't think we'll have to talk about what IoT is. Uh, I'm sure all of us uh, would have heard about this buzzword uh, in in every place around us. Um, so in a in a in a nutshell, right? IoT, uh, we are talking about connected things, uh, and and when we are able to connect uh, uh, things and uh, add some intelligence uh, to uh, dumb things like you know either this uh, chairs or like vehicles or or a smart plug. Uh, we are able to find in innovative ways of uh, solving business challenges, uh, business problems, and uh, it is uh, uh, also creating new ways of improving customer experiences. Uh, but at the same time, uh, IoT and security has been always a topic of uh, concern for a lot of us, uh, like for, for reasons that we saw. And, and we see uh, uh, news articles uh, popping up in our uh, daily life like this, like where uh, Jeeps are like, you know, taken over uh, remotely uh, <laughs> while they're in action. Uh, Casino is getting hacked uh, through a connected fish tank that is in, no, connected to the Wi-Fi network that is in, 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 the, in the casino. Uh, not only in in uh, in uh, these uh, um, uh, industries where consumers are impacted, but also it is in medical industry where pacemakers are impact impacted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Some of them are old, some of the news are new, but the trend has been continuing, right? Uh, so it is uh, it is always a sticky topic when it comes to security when we have these connected devices and the concern goes up every day when we have more and more connected uh, devices so that's where we'll analyze uh, things in terms of uh, when these things are uh, connected uh, how we can take care of making them it is uh, secure and we are able to uh, identify uh, the devices are uh, talking to a um, uh, the, the cloud uh, uh, servers instances in a, ma in, a, in a manner that nobody can tamper with the data, nobody can manipulate the data, nobody can sniff the data. At the same time, uh, you know, scale this infrastructure as well so that uh, you know it can handle millions of devices because we are connecting everything these days, right? So, so but what is what is so different and what is so difficult uh, about IoT security, right? Uh, so we'll try to uh, explore this uh, with this example uh, for the conversation today in the next 30 minutes. Uh, let's take a, 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 the, like a e-mobility rental corporation, uh, and uh, you, you can probably compare this. Even if you're from, from Bangalore, you can compare this to the uh, electric vehicle that you can rent, borrow uh, for a day or a few hours. Uh, uh, but but. What goes into like you know this vehicle, right? Uh, uh, first of all, it has like a computing processor, a processing unit uh, that is uh, you know built into the vehicle itself, uh, which is doing some you know uh, action calculations and, and and processing and enforces certain actions and sends a lot of data to the cloud uh, about uh, what is a uh, what is the vehicle doing, etc. Right? So in that manner, it has a lot of connectivity options like you know Bluetooth for uh, users to interact with the vehicle, to unlock the vehicle, start the vehicle. Uh, it has GPS for tracking where the, where the vehicle is currently located, so that uh, we can show it to users. Uh, you know, as an organization which is managing these vehicles, I can monitor them um, and and uh, make it available to the users. Uh, and uh, usually, this connectivity is through some sort of like 4G, 3G connectivity uh, for, for the for the cloud. These are like battery powered. They're like bunch of sensors associated with like you know, how is the how is the fuel or battery left, or how the vehicle is performing, uh, what are the uh, whether how fast it is going, etc. Right, and uh, on top of this, you know, all of them are like controlled by a piece of software. You know, we call it as a firmware that is uh, you know running on this vehicle itself, and uh, any firmware uh, you know has to be uh, uh, has to be like you know uh, have should have the ability to update itself. Uh, you know, when it comes to zero days and vulnerabilities, it is not a matter of when, uh, uh, sorry, it's not a matter of if, but it's always when you'll find it, right? Uh, so there's always there, uh, it is when you identify it, we should be, you should have the ability to like patch it at the right time. Uh, so that, that means that we should be able to send the updates over the air and uh, that has to happen in a secure fashion as well, right? Because if that is compromised, everything is lost. Uh, and of course, uh, all of this happens uh, from uh, through uh, like you know orchestrated from a cloud, uh, and you know all the data is collected in the cloud, and all of this has to be secure at, at every layer that we can think of. You know we have to make sure like you know it is secure. Uh, so we'll try to analyze uh, you know with this example for the next uh, 20, 30 minutes. So, so. What are the differences, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm sure like uh, many of us will be familiar with building uh, web applications, uh, backend systems, APIs, mobile apps, etc. Uh, so when it comes to those kind of applications, uh, um, 
when, when it comes to authenticating or identifying who is trying to use the system, first question that we think is, okay, who are the users? Uh, who, you know, what is their like, user name? Like, you know, or the email, or unique identifier, like uh, email address, et cetera. Uh, but here, uh, they are, you know, these are things, like they're not users. That means they're not going to have like a, a username or identity. Uh, and all the model that we build around like users and passwords and you know, how we can have them remember the username, password, and, and come back with the same across like different uh, instances in, in, the, in the timeline goes for a toss, right? Uh, so these are like things and, uh, you know, they have like serial numbers probably uh, uh, as identifiers. Uh, but beyond that, you know, all the models that we have with uh, users around, built around users goes out of the window. The next one is like credentials. Like, you know, uh, uh, we, uh, for users, again, we can have a password-based authentication or a social login, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, when it comes to these devices, um, you know, they don't have, they cannot remember, like, they cannot have passwords. Of course, you can ha say that, you know, you can store the password in the device and then make them use the password. But that, What's the point of it, right? You know, if, if these uh, devices are physically compromised and somebody can extract the password, then they are into the network. Then our model goes for a toss. So that's where um, typically, you know, cryptographic keys are used uh, for uh, securing this communication. But still with cryptographic keys as well, we have the same problem. Like, you know, how do we store the keys, uh, especially the private key part, uh, so that uh, securely so that, you know, nobody can tamper with it or, or take it out of the system. We'll, we'll see how we can address this, uh, uh, you know, problem. But, but in general, you know, password-based model doesn't work anymore. Uh, talking about, uh, like, yeah, when sessions, right? Uh, in, a, in a web, uh, you know, we have a concept of sessions where, like, people log in, use the, use the system, use the application, and log out, you know? And a uh, lot of uh, uh, concepts are modeled around that, like, you know, token expiry in case of JOT is modeled around, like, what is the typical time that a session would exist and uh, what is the reasonable time in which we can ask the user to re-log in again. But in this case of, you know, these connected things, you know, uh, they're going to be online and session is always going to be there as long as the device is uh, in the, on the field, right? Uh, uh, the, right from the moment the device is powered on, out of the factory and powered on, until end of life of the device, it is always going to be connected. Uh, so that means, again, our model around uh, sessions and session timeout goes for a toss. Uh, just one point, not to be confused, right? Uh, you know, in, in any typical IoT uh, uh, system, there are going to be these things which are going to be connecting to the network, and there are going to be users who are using these things. Uh, we are not talking about uh, like, you know, the uh, authentication and identity model for the users, but irrespective of whether a user is using a, the thing or not, it is always going to be connected. So that's why like, these two are two different things, and we cannot extend the authentication model of the users for the things as well, because again, we are, it's not really a, the user who is trying to do those operations, right? If you try to uh, uh, you know, analyze from that lens. Uh, so, so that's why like, you know, two different uh, uh, um, boundaries that exist you know, uh, between the, you know, the thing and the users. And it, it could be that sometimes one user owned that thing and then always that user is using. Sometimes different users could be using that thing at different points in time, like the vehicle example, right? Uh, moving to the next interesting thing is the uh, environment in which these uh, uh, things or devices operate, right? Uh, again, in this case, uh, if you take, uh, we'll have to take it that uh, a hacker who is trying to hack this vehicle system have unlimited time and resources uh, and, and uh, uh, whatever that is necessary for them to like, you know, take things apart, do whatever that they can do possibly that you can imagine. Uh, and uh, still we should be able to uh, 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 protect our system so that even if that device uh, goes, uh, uh, you know, even if, if whatever that happens to device, nobody can get into the network, get, get into the system and cause more damage. Um, and next one uh, uh, is like in the nature of traffic. Uh, so with these kind of things, now we are talking about uh, uh, varied kind of traffic, like, you know, uh, unlike HTTP, which is like one direction and, and we just send the data and, and wait for response. Uh, so here we have bi bidirectional communication with MQTT, uh, rich, rich uh, 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 protocols like uh, you know we can stream uh, sensor data uh, uh, continuously or, or stream even media uh, uh, continuously, right? So so our our security models should hold good for these kind of uh, different types of protocols and communications models as well. Sorry. We'll, we'll come to that. Uh, just, you know, so far we are just seeing, you know, comparing like what are the differences. Uh, so they will, will come over like, you know, how, how do we secure that? And of course, uh, 
with, with a, when it comes to IoT, when you're connecting anything and everything, you know, we'll have to assume, or we have to plan and build uh, uh, our uh, architecture such way that it can scale for this millions, right? Uh, even if we come up with a, like a great uh, foolproof architecture, but if it is not going to scale, it's not going to be practical and useful for our situations. So these are, I mean, general, you know, just uh, setting the ground so that, you know, we can uh, uh, build our model uh, uh, architecture that will help us to, you know, come to address all these differences and, and, and uh, help us solve this problem, right? Um, so, again, there are a number of ways in which it can be solved, but probably today we'll look at like one particular approach in which we use uh, two particular concepts, uh, one on the device side of things and one on the cloud and infrastructure side of things that can help us to navigate this uh, uh, whole situation. Uh, those two are uh, TPM. Uh, it is called as, uh, uh, I mean, Trusted Platform Module. Uh, it, it goes by different names. Uh, we'll, we'll dive deep into about like, you know, what is TPM, how, how it can help us to solve this particular problem. Uh, second part is with uh, mutual TLS uh, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, client TLS, which is uh, specifically here we'll see example of uh, with X409 certificates, which are issued by uh, uh, certificate authorities and uh, PKA, private key, public key infrastructure. Um, so, so anybody here who is like you know building IoT solution systems? Uh, okay, we, I see a few hands. That is good. Um, uh, anybody have used like you know apply TPM uh, in this context? Okay, great. Uh, that we have a few hands. Good. Um, so, what is TPM, right? Um, so, there are like different uh, uh, things that uh, exist in this space. You know, they go with different names: uh, TPM, HSM, Trust Zone, Secure Element, Secure Enclave. Uh, uh, all, all of these are like a bit different. Uh, I wouldn't claim that you know they are exactly the same, uh, and uh, they have like different strengths, different uh, merits, and they operate slightly differently. But they all of them do have a common goal, uh, which is to uh, securely store some information on the chip uh, with, that is like tamper-proof, uh, that cannot be tampered with or, or extracted out. Uh, probably you know secure element or secure enclave probably would be something that you are familiar with. You are like an Apple. Uh, a devices user who cares about uh, uh, security and privacy. You know, all the, uh, the touch ID, face ID, you know, all the uh, biometrics that uh, Apple devices uses are securely stored in secure enclave uh, that cannot be, you know, uh, that never leaves the device and that cannot be tampered with as well. Or, or if you try to tamper with, it might get destroyed rather than, like, you know, giving out the secret. Um, so, so what, what exactly is a TPM, right? I know this all sounds good, but what exactly is a TPM, right? Uh, so TPM is a security coprocessor, right? Uh, typically, when it comes to you know these kind of IoT embedded systems, uh, even if they take an example, we said like you know these devices have an onboard chip or a computer which is doing some computation. That means it has some processing unit, it has some memory storage, etc. So uh, TPM is a security coprocessor that sits along with that uh, you know main unit. Uh, so that means that, that is different, but at the same time it sits along with that unit and connected over some uh, communi communication protocols. And uh, it has a specific purpose. Uh, it can only do certain things and, and certain things very well, uh, which is like generating cryptographic keys. Uh, and uh, storing them in a secure fashion uh, that, that cannot be uh, tampered with, that cannot be extracted, or that cannot be uh, read. But at the same time, uh, using these cryptographic keys for performing some uh, uh, cryptographic operations like encryption, decryption, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, how it works is like, you know, um, you know, these keys, uh, cryptographic, these uh, TPM modules can generate cryptographic keys, uh, and uh, usually the private key part of the pair Never leaves the TPM, right? Uh, it is generated and stored within the device, uh, within the within the within the chip, and uh, it can never extract that uh, from the chip. All you can do is like use that pair to uh, sign your payload or like encrypt the data. Uh, of course, you can take the public key part uh, and and use it uh, uh, and share it with the other side so that it can be used to, to you know make sure that information is coming from this particular unit that you can that you understand and uh, uh, authorize. Uh, but but otherwise that's that's a trick. We'll we'll see how exactly it is put to use in a production system in the next uh, uh, next minute. Uh, but but otherwise, like you know, it is uh, uh, physically uh, isolated and uh, it cannot be tampered with. So basically, this provides as a hardware base. Uh, it provides a you know hardware based root of trust and uh, um, and it allows us to build a model on top of this, right? Um, 
So, but uh, we said, like, you know, this uh, chip can uh, generate a key pair. And typically, in a, in a cryptographic uh, model uh, with a key pair, you need to have the public key sent to the uh, other part of the world, wherever the, you know, we are trying to connect and communicate, so that the communication can be verified that you know, it is uh, coming from a trusted source. Right? How does it happen? Uh, so typically, these devices, when they are made in the factory and the assembly happens, uh, there's a workflow that uh, it usually accompanies that, where these, uh, uh, you know, from each of the devices, along with the information like you know, its uh, serial number and uh, you know, model number and whatnot, the public key of the key pair is uh, collected. It, 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 it's, it's picked up and collected in a manifest, and that is sent to the cloud in a secure fashion. Uh, so that uh, whenever there's a communication that is coming from the device that are signed with these keys, the cloud can identify that it is indeed coming from this particular device that it is claiming to be, right? Um, and uh, this also allows us to do some more fancy stuff like, you know, uh, for example, if you are buying a, a connected uh, vehicle for yourself, uh, as long as in the server side there's an entry made that, you know, this device is, for, is purchased by this user, uh, and... Uh, you know, you don't. You have you have some specific preferences, like you know, I need uh, uh, the vehicle stop speed to be configured to be like this, but the mode to be in performance mode, etc. As soon as the vehicle is delivered, uh, with nobody doing any of the configuration on the device manually for you, and you connect to the device, it can download the particular profile for you at, with the information that you know it is connected to your uh, uh, profile uh, and and your user and your preferences, and you can set those profiles. Uh, but anyway, we are we are slightly digressing. Will uh, will that may not be that's not related to security, right? That's more like sophistication that we can get uh, from this. Uh, so so this is this allows us. So basically, this information that we collect uh, and and store in the cloud, right? Where we have got some details like serial number and it's like date of manufacturing, etc. The important part is the like the uh, public key uh, that gets. Uh, uh, stored along with each of the particular serial number of the devices that uh, uh, that that are manufactured from this uh, um, factory. Um, so, okay, it allow we saw that you know it can generate keys. Uh, what other operations it can uh, do, right? Uh, so typically, uh, the the root key that is generated from this device is not meant for everyday operation, because that allow that also leaves us open to another problem. Uh, which is uh, privacy. Uh, I'll explain that, uh, how it is uh, related to privacy. So, so typically these vehicles or these systems can talk to like different services and if you're going to build our security model based on this key, you know, individual uh, uh, devices, uh, uniquely identifiable private uh, public key pair, that means any system that you are going to talk to can know that, uh, okay, this particular request is coming from this particular device and uh, that can lead to like, like you know if if you choose if you want to like you know, avoid uh, uh, you know publishing that you know this information is coming from your particular user then it leaves us no choice right so that's where uh, what happens is like typically the in, the pri the root or the primary key pair is not generally used for securing communication but rather more key pairs are derived from this individual key pair and when you derive more key pairs you know, you can throw throw that away whenever that you don't need, uh, and uh, you can generate more, right? So that's where typically more key pairs are generated. And uh, so we also mentioned that, you know, this uh, uh, TPM can be used for securing uh, more information, uh, you know, in, in, in that, right? It doesn't mean that, you know, we are going to be, like, feeding in more information into the small, you know, TPM itself. But with the key pairs that are generated from TPM, we can s secure a portion of our file system itself, uh, right, where uh, only only the processor which is uh, which can which which trusts the TPM uh, and has access to the TPM uh, can decrypt the data and then read the data. This is the same concept probably that you would have seen in uh, Apple devices encryption or even Microsoft does the same uh, with uh, with BitLocker, I believe. Uh, so all of them, all of these operations are like kind of built on top of this uh, individual uh, security chip, which is called uh, TPM. Um, um, so, so if, in fact, if you have, a, you know, some of the modern systems uh, or machine that you have bought in the, in the last few years, most probably that you that comes with TPM. Uh, so it is not only, you know, use, getting used in IoT devices, but any system that is always connected to the network where you have to make sure the system is uh, 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 not compromised with the malicious actors and uh, uh, and the network communication is tampered with, right? Uh, TPM is used, and Go TPM is a tool uh, that uh, you can use in a, in a, in a 
uh, in a Linux world uh, to interact with your TPM and perform these operations like you know generating or getting the public key, sorry, getting the public key out of it. Uh, and uh, uh, and seal seal is nothing but like you know where you can store uh, information in a secure fashion uh, on the file system, right? And and unseal the data. So so these are all the uh, things on the device side, uh, you know, where this allows as a mechanism where we can uh, generate a key pair that is unique to the device, send the public key to the server, and establish a, a secure communication uh, which, which can be used for like you know uh, back and forth. But these, this leaves us with another problem, right? Uh, so we are talking about millions of devices. That means uh, this uh, manifest that we are talking that has to be collected in the cloud would have like millions of entries, right? And if you have to refer to this uh, in every request that is coming from the device, we can do that. I know it's, it's, we are going to be just looking up, but it can be it become soon expen be, become expensive and become out of hand, especially when you are generating more uh, key pairs out of it. Uh, it. It adds more complexity, right? So that's where the next part of uh, the uh, uh, solution that comes into picture, which is uh, um, mutual TLS with X4 and certificates. Uh, I think we all know X4 and certificates. It's not uh, you know something that is new. It has been, uh, um, in, in fact, it was uh, it has uh, designed and defined like 33 years ago, uh, uh, and uh, it has been uh, in use uh, uh, in all our TLS communication, which is the server-side uh, security uh, uh, protocol communication, right? When when we do browser uh, HTTPS, right? Uh, so it is nothing but a TLS, TLS communication. Uh, the what the uh, endpoint uh, like www.xyz.com, what they claim to be and how they convey that to the browser is through an XPO and certificate which they offer. And, and the browsers can verify the uh, authenticity of the endpoint, what they're claiming to be, through the root of trust. Um, but uh, that's all with the server-side TLS. Uh, but, but here we are talking about uh, mutual TLS, which is client-side TLS. So in client-side TLS, uh, what happens is like you know the individual devices are offered uh, their own certificate uh, and uh, but we would still need some secure fashion uh, uh, security fashion uh, uh, that uh, allows us to provide certificates to uh, the actual entity what they're claiming to be right uh, uh, only then this certificate themselves are going to be useful so we'll see how it is done right uh, uh, so Again, as I mentioned, right, uh, this is certificates are usually issued by a, a public key infrastructure, PKI, uh, and uh, uh, this is a hierarchy of uh, uh, certificate authorities. Uh, we'll see that in, the, in, in a bit. But what essentially client certificates offer is a standardized mechanism uh, uh, for uh, establishing the identity of the individual devices and things uh, that uh, uh, we want uh, to, to be part of uh, in the IoT network. And it offers like a passwordless uh, mechanism and a renewal mechanism. These certificates are like throwaway, right? Uh, this can be issued n number of times. Uh, of course, it has implication. It is not completely free, but uh, uh, it allows a mechanism for us to renew this whenever needed and, and, a, secure and, and, a, and a safe mechanism as well. Um, so, so yeah, in our case of the vehicle, you know, this would be like an example certificate that the device would uh, uh, receive. Uh, here you can see, you know, the subject uh, common name is like the serial number of the device, no surprise there, and some more details like, you know, what organization and locality. An interesting part is the issuer. The issuer is like, you know, organization is uh, the Acme Corp that we are talking today example. Uh, but uh, the common name of that is, uh, is something different, right? It is not Acme Corp. So typically, with X4 and 9 certificates, uh, you don't necessarily have to issue one certificate to every device that you are, are, talk, are talking to. But usually, in a, in a world where we have uh, uh, you know complex business functionalities uh, uh, built on around these devices, we have different business units who are managing those different functionalities. So in this case. I can imagine, uh, you know, uh, the vehicle performance is monitored by one group. The uh, who is using and utilization of the devices, you know, and users and usage around that uh, is is going to be managed by another, uh, uh, you know, organization unit. And uh, the uh, fuel efficiency will be probably monitored and managed and, and tweaked by a different organization unit. And each of these different functionalities uh, would have, like, you know, you can imagine like having different endpoints, different services, and different components on the devices. 
uh, and all of them can be issued their own certificate as well, right? We don't have to necessarily issue like one certificate uh, per device. And, and these certificates do have like an expiry, right? Uh, so, so this expiry is the time like, you know, uh, within which the certificate is valid. And depending on what functionality this certificate is going to be used for, and the security and threat model uh, around that functionality, this uh, expiry date can be you know, identified and established. So this allows us to have a mechanism in which, if needed, we can have like a shorter living certificate where we can make sure even if the certificate is compromised for whatever reason, like you know nobody can misuse it for a longer duration. But at the same time, uh, you know, in general, uh, with MTLS world, the expiry day time is usually in a matter of like days and weeks or months, uh, rather than like you know hours or minutes. So. Yeah, we also mentioned that you know it is usually issued by uh, hierarchy and different org units uh, uh, can be issuing certificates, uh, different certificates, right? Uh, and uh, so essentially they form the like you know certificate uh, 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 root of uh, uh, trust for this communication, with the topmost entity being the trust anchor. Uh, and uh, how individual um, uh, organization uh, gets a root certificate a trust anchor established is itself is like you know through a third party or a, it's, it's outside it, it's via the outside uh, scope uh, where usually you know established certificate authority like digital and whatnot uh, you know usually issue those certificates but it's not necessary that you know individual organization have to you know buy that as long as they can very the root uh, can verify itself through other means right you know they can be the trust anchor and the hierarchy allows us to you know verify the uh, verify the uh, uh, authenticity as long as they have the public key and the common name from the above, right? Above in the parent, right? And, and this allows us to verify in a cascading manner. So with these, uh, so on one side we saw like TPM, uh, uh, you know, we saw like you know uh, 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 certificate authority issuing certificates. But how do they map? And you know, when do these devices get a certificate, right? Uh, so basically, when the when the device boots up for the first time, when it recognizes that you know it doesn't have a, like a valid certificate that it can use for communication, uh, it is going to like collect all the information that it knows, like its serial number, public key, uh, etc., uh, and it's going to sign the request using the TPM key that uh, we initially saw, and it is going to send the rec uh, you know request along with the CSR. CSR is the uh, uh, signing uh, certificate signing request that it is constructing for getting the. X49, uh, uh, the client certificate, right? So the server now it has to all it has to do like a lookup, uh, look up whether uh, this identifier and the signature that it is sending and claiming to be is in our known list of uh, public keys, and as long as it it uh, uh, can validate that, it can talk to the CSR. Uh, uh, I mean, talk uh, to the PK passing the CSR, and you know. And the PK can issue a certificate uh, for the particular functionality that it is asking the certification for. So this is how, like, you know, devices like get issued a certificate uh, whenever they don't have one, either the first time or whenever it expires. And after a certificate is issued, uh, for every business operation, it's a matter of just sending the request, whether it's HTTP or WebSockets or MQTTS, whatever it is, right? Uh, those requests can be signed with a, a client a client uh, uh, certificate that it has just uh, been issued. And uh, when the request is processed on our server side, right now the server has to still verify that you know it is a valid request, right? So, but thanks to our uh, you know hierarchy and uh, uh, PKI, it's just a matter of validating the certificate and the authenticity of it. There is no need to look up a common database. Uh, there is no need to, uh, you know, uh, it, it, there is no need to perform complex complex operation for us to identify uh, that whether it's a valid request or not. What it means, it allows us a, a easy a way to scale this one, right, uh, in a horizontal ma manner because there is no shared state, there is no cache, there is no need to like you know uh, 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 um, state associated with the, with the each instances for us to you know where the complexity comes in for us to scale, right? So so basically this means. As many devices that you want to scale up, you know, all we have to do is, at least for the initial authentication and authorization part, all you have to do is, like, you know, uh, scale this one horizontally, and uh, uh, this allows an easy mechanism for us to scale for millions of devices or any number that you can imagine. Of course, uh, you'll have to increase the number of uh, instances that you can put up here, but at least no need to scale vertically, which is the challenging part when it comes to scaling, right? And the rest of the you know business functionality goes uh, and no surprise over there. So so 
putting you know these two to the right typically in a in a in a world uh, where more devices come up and they register themselves and uh, start performing operations business operations uh, you, you have like a load balancer and 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 the tls termination happens in a you know right after that uh, so one thing to watch out for is you know the tls and mtls termination happen uh, should ter termination should happen at the same place where the certificates are extracted and the identifier of the individual entity that it is claiming to be can be uh, exchanged or basically identified from the certificate and uh, it is annotated to that particular request for the rest of the uh, rest of the you know life uh, cycle of that particular request um, and, the, and that is usually done with like a xfcc header in a uh, in a http world there are equivalents in uh, rtp or uh, uh, or uh, mqtt world as well but the concept is like you know from the certificate you validate it and then get the identity of it and then annotate the request and the and just the annotated value alone is used by rest of the system for any authorization if it has to perform that uh, and the other part of uh, the thing exists just for issuing the certificate. This part, of course, has to be, uh, uh, you know, at least the PKA as a, as a, uh, has to be like, you know, secured in, in its own way. But uh, that is not any different than, you know, uh, securing your keys in any, any application, not, general, not, not specific to IoT, right? And, and this particular part, right, you know, where you have like a certificate issuance and uh, done this way to the devices. So this is the particular mechanism or in fact like you know uh, barring the part of like you know the business operation the rest of the thing is a common technique that is followed by many iot cloud providers or iot platform providers these days you know azure iot google iot or uh, aws uh, sorry um, uh, gcp everybody does the same uh, and there's a there's even a name called uh, uh, certificate vending machine uh, i think that's a that's a uh, uh, name that this uh, this architecture uh, is, it goes with uh, so basically you have a vending machine sort of uh, analogy where uh, these devices can get cert issued certificate based on like you know initial trust that is established with tpm and this allows us to scale our business operations both on the cloud and the device side in an independent manner uh, that uh, that is also not uh, uh, expensive uh, to operate and scale um, yeah, just tying back to the previous talk, uh, you know, this part of like, you know, termination and the client validation can be, you know, done with a proxy or a sidecar or even eBPF. This is something, in fact, we are exploring in our work that we are doing uh, 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 for our customer. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, there is, there's, I mean, it's, it's, it's once you get, you know, what to do, it's, it's a matter of identifying a way that works for your, your particular situation. So, all right. Um, so what are some of the uh, best practices like when you do this, right? Uh, this is great that we can issue certificates, uh, but at the same time, uh, how and how often we issue the certificate is really important, right? Uh, you know, we don't want to uh, mix up the uh, the uh, expiry duration of the uh, certificate and uh, not having a way to uh, invalidate them, right? So that's why it's really important to identify for your uh, threat model of uh, for your business what makes sense to be like a reasonable expiry date uh, for e each of the different functionality that you can think of, and have a way that is automated for the certificates to be renewed, rotated, and that too in a in a in a automated manner, right? And we don't want to be like you know doing this manually. Uh, Otherwise, just we are accumulating uh, trouble for us tomorrow when you have to do it. Uh, and I'd also have a way to monitor the usage of the certificates and, and have your workflow modeled around it. For example, like, you know, uh, if, if a particular device is coming up and trying to communicate after like a long period of silence, maybe you want to re-trigger expired certificates immediately and re-trigger the authentication flow uh, just to avoid any, uh, uh, any uh, suspicion uh, you know, because of its operation, right? You can try to do those kind of things. Uh, and uh, so, so X four N one itself uh, does not uh, talk about like uh, modeling permissions uh, 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 around it. You know, or, so for what we saw is just the authentication part of it. Uh, but but permissions again, once you deal with the problem of like you know ident establishing the identity, permissions it's not uh, something that is uh, any different for IoT, right? There are ways uh, uh, in which you can extend the X409 with its own extensions for uh, adding permissions. Typically, when you are coming from a JART world where you can have roles uh, 
it it is very tempting to add those permissions into X419 itself, but probably I would uh, recommend to keep these two things separate uh, and not uh, uh, you know do too much of extensions with X419. Um, uh, we can we can do that, uh, but only only challenges like you know uh, the more we extend, we lose the uh, flexibility of interoperability, right? Uh, uh, you know uh, X419 as a standard exists, and a lot of cloud providers and and uh, third parties do understand it. But if we uh, extend more, we risk the part of like you know losing interoperability. Uh, and, and again, uh, something that I want to stress more is like you know, do the different systems and different products and uh, and different uh, business uh, exist, and and there are uh, the threat model for each of the system systems are very very different. So that means any solution that you see, do your own threat modeling for your business problem and business uh, 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 impact that it can cause if something goes wrong, right? So please do you know, your own threat model uh, and uh, come up with a solution that fits your uh, risk pattern. Um, I think with that, uh, uh, yeah, some of these things we saw. OK, important point, point uh, to watch out for is the certificate revocation list. Uh, so, so far, we have been talking about uh, issuing certificates, right? Uh, but what if a system or a particular device is compromised and that you have identified and you want to revoke them, you'll have to communicate that to the rest of the system so that they, they stop you know, uh, processing or accepting requests for, from that particular device, right? Um, and uh, that part is not easy, right? You know, so far, we have built a system where individual parts of the system can operate in their own uh, uh, without talking to a central party for uh, uh, authenticating a, a particular device that is trying to talk. But when it comes to revocation, we need to have a central system where we have, like, you know, maintain a centralized list of certificates that are revoked, or at least, you know, distribute a copy uh, to each of the system uh, so that they, they maintain their own revoke, uh, uh, revoke certificates. Uh, it is uh, again uh, much easier to miss this part when you are building the system, uh, and uh, it, and it's it's going to bite uh, heavily like when it happens. So something to watch out for uh, right from the beginning uh, about the revocation. Um, yeah, that's all I've got for today. So basically, uh, just to recap, uh, you know, with the TPM, we have a mechanism for us to securely store keys that uh, that allows us uh, 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 that provides a fast way for us to like you know. Uh, uh, not uh, giving the ability to read the keys by untrusted parties, but at the same time using the keys for uh, for uh, the communication um, from the, from that particular uh, devices, and uh, with that, like you know, we establish a trust and issue certificates, and we use that for communication and the cycle repeats every time the certificate expires. Uh, this has this al this is a technique that we allowed us to scale like you know a uh, system that you have been building for like millions of devices, and uh, we have a system you know this one running on like multiple uh, uh, kinds of devices like IoT devices, edge computing devices, even even laptops and mobile devices, and uh, that's why like you know we had this experience that wanted to share with you all. Thank you.